is Jason Shear. He's the editor of WildcatAuthority.com. Jason, vindication for you on so many fronts. Oh my gosh. People said, no, don't listen to Jason Shear. He doesn't know what he's talking about. You were right. How vindicated do you feel now that Arizona, Arizona State, and Utah are in the Big 12? Yeah, I got to say that that day where they announced it, it felt pretty good for me. <laughs> <laughs> Realignment gets crazy. The fans get crazy. But yeah, when, when that finally happened, it was it was definitely nice. OK, so um, let, how many Twitter followers did you gain, by the way, last week? Well, I'm one of them, by the way. I, I would say I think it was like six or seven thousand. Wow. That's, that's significant growth. <laughs> Uh, right there, yeah. which is also what the incoming schools gained in TV revenue uh, in the future. <laughs> Jason, walk us through sort of the timeline and what you were hearing and seeing and, and how this all went down with Arizona and then ultimately Arizona State and Utah as well. I, I think that, I mean, we could start a year ago, but once Colorado made the decision to move to the Big 12, I think everything really picked up. And basically the school president's um, went to George Kliakoff and said, we need to see whatever numbers you're able to present. And so uh, last week, those numbers were presented finally, and they just weren't good. And then once that happened, schools got very serious about moving. Um, they were all talking to each other. And then on Thursday night, um, Arizona, I know the timeline's a little murky out there, but Arizona basically got permission um, to enter the Big 12, there was a Board of Regents meeting and all that earlier in the week, and it kind of came to a head on Friday morning when they uh, were all Utah, Arizona, ASU were all able to agree at the same time uh, to go to the Big 12. Jason, there was this report that came out late Thursday night or early Friday morning, depending on when you sleep and how you want to look at that, that the remaining nine teams in the Pac-12 were all of a sudden going to rally and they were going to stay together. And this was coming out from some notable national sources. But you kind of dug in and said, no, nah, I don't think that's going to happen. Um, what were you hearing on Friday morning as it pertains to the Pac-9 trying to stick together? And how much validity was there in that push to not allow any other teams or not encourage almost any other teams to leave the conference? Yeah, I mean, I said at the time that had the Pac-12 stayed together on that Friday morning, it would have been one of the most shocking things that I've I've seen play out. Because as of Thursday night, Arizona was gone. They were working on the rollout uh, to join the conference and all that. And the deal hadn't changed. And so the deal wasn't good enough earlier in the week. And I just couldn't figure out why the deal would all of a sudden be good enough to sign for everyone on Friday. And Oregon and Washington from what I understood on Friday morning, we're basically trying to leverage a little bit more money. They were going to the Big Ten. They had already decided it. They were trying to basically leak some stuff and, and use reporters to get some more money. They weren't really able to do it. And then they didn't actually go to the Pac-12 meeting. And no one really found that out until after the meeting was concluded. But Oregon and Washington um, basically called each of the schools that were still in the Pac-12 about 10 minutes before the meeting and said, we're going to the Big Ten we apologize, we have to do this. So it, it, you know, there wasn't a point on Friday morning where I said to myself, oh man, this, the Pac-12 is staying together. It was just kind of weird how it, how it all played out. When do you sort of uh, pin down the demise of the league? Because to me, it wasn't last week. It was probably in the years previous when it had opportunities to, to add other teams or join, even join forces with the Big 12 a couple of years ago, or uh, let's be honest, like 10 or 20 years ago, there were other teams that could have been added too, and they weren't. BYU, we've been sitting there thinking maybe BYU to the Pac-12 was the best option. In the end, it's the Big 12, and it feels like everything worked out, I guess, for BYU. But w w where and when do you point to sort of the demise of that league? There, there's a lot of things to point to. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, the, the, the first thing that comes to mind is years ago when Texas and Oklahoma announced they were leaving the Big 12, the Pac-12 had an opportunity to basically merge or, or take the, the remaining Big 12 schools and the presidents passed on it. And they said, we don't want to expand. Um, had they decided to expand and, and take those schools, uh, the leftover eight schools, I believe at the time, we wouldn't be in this you know situation. The Pac-12 would be financially stable and all that. Um, under this, uh, under Kliakov, the biggest thing that I think the Pac-12 went wrong is when they went to market, they actually pretty much got 
the Big 12 offer, the 31.7 per school. George Kliakov felt it wasn't enough, that they could get more money. The Big 12 basically said, you know, we're cool with that deal. They went to market way earlier than anyone expected. They signed that deal before the Pac-12, and then the Pac-12 was out of luck because ESPN didn't want to spend more money for the Pac-12. The other networks were Big Ten involved in that stuff. And so basically the Pac-12 misplayed or, or Kliakov misplayed the entire situation. And then the money that he thought would be there wasn't there. He asked for $40 million at school, and, and, and it wasn't happening. So had he signed the deal for 31.7, uh, it, again, the Pac-12 wouldn't be in this situation. Jason Shear is the editor of WildcatAuthority.com. He is on BYU Sports Nation. He has been just absolutely ingrained in the Pac-12, Big 12 realignment madness. And madness is probably putting it lightly, Jason. But just from your personal standpoint, especially going back to just before Colorado moved, and you had been in on that. It wasn't just Arizona. Like, you had been involved with the whole, like, idea that somebody from the Pac-12, the Four Corner Schools, could break away if this deal doesn't come together fast enough. But they're in their, quote-unquote, ivory tower pointing fingers at you in the great and spacious building of the Pac-12 that is no longer. And here you are saying uh, it, this is still going to happen. So... When did you when did you first know that somebody 100% was going to break away and that you were actually going to be right? Uh, Colorado was the worst kept secret in the realignment. <laughs> I mean, they, they were going. I, and that's why it was really surprising when Kliakov went there on, on Football Media Day and was like, they're all sticking together because everybody knew Colorado was gone. I would say that Colorado had been talking to other schools in the conference for weeks. So once, you know, it was just a matter of when Colorado was announcing it. I'm not, I'm actually not sure there was a number that could have kept Colorado in the conference. Like they were pretty steadfast. And then when that initial, when, when that meeting actually happened after Colorado left and I heard that day what the numbers were and, and it wasn't even the numbers. It was, it, it was a hundred percent streaming. Apple would not guarantee any linear aspect of it. And once I found that out, uh, it was I knew it was pretty much over because the Arizona school president was on record as saying the most streaming he would take would be 50%. Mm. He could probably live with that. And this was 100%. And it just, it wasn't going to happen. But Colorado, I mean, they, they've been going for a while. It was just a matter of how and when they were going to announce it. I know Colorado played games for the last 12 years in the Pac-12, but I'm not sure they went there. Uh, they've been going sort of Big 12 vibes for a long time, right? And now Arizona, Arizona State, Utah headed to the Big 12. How is this move being perceived by Arizona fans? Certainly in basketball, it's going to be wild. I think Arizona fans, to, to be honest, are taking it better than Utah and ASU fans. Uh, I, I think it's a great cultural fit with the conference. And at the end of the day, you know, Tucson is a very different place. The U of A is a very different place than the other schools in the conference because this is a basketball town. And when you look at the Big 12 for basketball and some of the games that Arizona is going to be playing now, I mean, it's it's crazy. It's the best basketball conference in the nation. And so Arizona fans are are pretty pumped. And there's a long history of, of not getting along well with, with the Pac-12 and in recent memory. So, you know, fans are excited. It's different. I, I think that a lot of people are skeptical about change and, and some people don't deal well with change but for the most part I, I think Arizona fans that I've come across are beating the move with a lot of excitement. Jason I'm going to ask you to do your best and not let some of this rivalry bleed into uh, the question that I'm about to ask you because Arizona and Arizona State has a lot of vitriol just like BYU and Utah but Jeremy and I sit here in Studio B and around BYU facilities, and, and we just wonder, what, what the heck's going on at Arizona State? Why was there so much trepidation and hesitancy for Arizona State when the writing was clearly on the wall that the Pac-12 was a dead end to not just happily accept the invite to the Big 12? And then when you get in the Big 12, you're still kind of just grovelly about it, and your athletic director says, well, I'm not going to Morgantown. I'm sending somebody else. He has apologized this morning, by the way. Okay, oh, so an apology now. What? So now we're good. Can, can you explain <laughs> to me why? Like, what's going on at Arizona State that has made them, to quote another writer, be dragged across the finish line to join the Big 12? I, I think the biggest issue is that people have to realize the, the school president, Michael Crow, 
Um, athletics are not a major priority for him. And this is a guy that stood by the side of Larry Scott to the bitter end. Yeah. Like supported Larry Scott, became close friends with Larry Scott, was very vocal on the promise of the Pac-12 years ago. So the Pac-12 was going to be ahead of everyone. And so in order for him to make the move to the Big 12, it was basically for him admitting that he had been wrong. Mm. And so there was a lot of pride there. And he was there to the better end now, too. Arizona and Utah were going to the Big 12 before ASU. It didn't take until late Thursday, early Friday morning where he finally made the move. He started thinking about it earlier that week, but he, he wanted to go. Like The only reason Arizona went to that Pac-12 meeting on Friday morning is because Michael Crow wanted them to. Like, give it one last hope. So I think a, a lot of it is pride, the fact that it didn't end up the way that he originally had said. And um, he's just not an athletics guy. I mean, it's just he, athletics just aren't a priority to him, and, and it kind of has shown in the last week or so. What power did the Board of Regents have relative to perhaps Arizona wanting to go by itself to the Big 12 without Arizona State, or was it always going to be both in the same league? It's, it's tough to say because the Arizona president is on record as saying before that they could go without ASU, that he didn't want to go without ASU. They wanted to go together, but if it came to it, they could make the move. And then last week, it you know the narrative was they're going together no matter what. I believe, based on what I've heard, that if it came down to it and ASU absolutely refused to go, Arizona would have gone by itself. Uh, I don't know how likely that is. I, I think that both schools have kind of come to an understanding that they were moving together. But if push came to shove, I, I absolutely believe that that Arizona could have gone alone. Jason, at the, Arizona's athletic director and president have, have both made mention uh, of the renewed rivalry now, a uh, potential renewed rivalry with the likes of BYU. And so, again, it's not a true rivalry, but BYU and Arizona definitely do have some history and a past. So how would you explain or define the rivalry relationship between BYU and Arizona and that relationship moving forward into the Big 12? I think it's a natural football rivalry. I really do. I mean, there, there's been, you know, I remember the game a, a couple of years ago, Jed Fish's first game in, in Vegas where BYU won. Uh, I still remember my, my wife and I went to the Vegas Bowl which was one of the, the those fun games, you know, atmospheres in Vegas that, that I've been to. And, and to me, uh, the, the way that BYU fans travel and, 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 you know, their fan base and all that, it, it, to me, it's, it's a natural rivalry. Like, I, I don't know how they're going to do divisions in the big 12 or how they're going to break that up. Uh, but I'd like to see Arizona and BYU play because there's a, there, there really is uh, a history between the two schools. Jason, great to talk with you. Uh, well done on your part uh, to <laughs> make it and uh, traverse through all of this realignment craziness. Uh, it, it's been fun. It's been maddening for sure. But uh, hopefully you get some some time off. Like, is it is it your vacation week is now? He's in fall camp, man. <laughs> yeah, it's in fall, it's fall camp. There's no vacation. There's no vacation. <laughs> it's, over. it's true. It's 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 not <laughs> happening. Uh, but hopefully with no realignment this week, it feels a little less stressful. We appreciate the time and joining BYU Sports Nation. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it.